Shalom. We are continuing with our um, study of the book of Galatians, and I wanted to let the people know that are watching online that my book is now in, so you can order it on Amazon and pick up a copy of the book uh, that goes along with the study we're doing. It has information, some that we haven't covered in these videos and in these studies, and you can go to my website, rabbierict.com, to find it or any of my other books. So. Uh, please uh, take advantage of that. I'm encouraging people to buy one for themselves, and then after they finish reading it, give it to someone that you would like to help understand how we as Messianic believers view Scripture, because the book will help them to understand how, uh, how we view the Scriptures as a complete and a whole rather than as separate parts. So uh, I encourage you to do that. <clears throat> we're on week five in our series on Galatians, and so we're on chapter five, verse one. And we just finished chapter four, which ends with, So then, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And we discussed how that is not talking about Torah versus grace, but it's talking about those that are allowing God to fill, fulfill his covenant by his sovereign supernatural power and those that are trying to bring it about by their own efforts and uh, abilities. In other words, like Abraham and, and Sarah, God said he was going to give them as many children as the sands of the sea and the stars and the sky when it didn't happen in enough time for them, when they got a little impatient. Uh, Abraham says, well, let Eliezer be my son. The Lord says, no, he's not going to be your son. And then uh, Sarah says, well, go with Hagar, and then Ishmael is born. Uh, and then, of course, Isaac is the fulfillment of God's promise. And so in Galatians 4, when we're talking about the covenants, we're not talking old covenant, new covenant. We're talking the covenant that God made with Isaac versus the covenant God made with Ishmael. And so keeping it in context of what it's talking about is really the only way we can understand the text that we're reading. So we continue with Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Messiah set us free to stand firm and do not be burdened by a yoke of slavery again. And again, as we're talking about this, we're not talking that God set us free from his word or from his instructions or from his Torah. We're set free from trying to do it ourselves by the supernatural power of God to make us new creations and make us new in his kingdom. So he's saying, don't put yourself back under the burden of your accomplishing what only God can accomplish for you. Paul says, listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Messiah will be of no benefit to you. And we talked from the very beginning that there was a problem in Galatia that Paul is responding to that problem, and the problem is that the Jewish believers there, some of them were telling the Gentile believers that in order for them to be fully born again or be in right standing before the Lord, they had to physically go through conversion and have circumcision in order to be right with the Lord. And Paul's saying, no, if, I tell you, if you let yourself be circumcised, Messiah will be of no benefit to you. Now, what he's saying is, is that if you try to do it by your physical doing, you're going to disconnect from Messiah being able to do for you what he's promised to do for you. He said, again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he's obligated to keep the whole Torah. Now, what he's saying here, and this is often misquoted by um, preachers and teachers, is he's saying that, um, that if you get circumcised, you're obligated to keep the whole Torah. And then people say, well, if you, you know, we don't have to keep the Torah because uh, you weren't. But what he's saying is, if you're going to say you have to do it physically in order to achieve right standing before the Lord, then you're saying you have to do everything physically and do all of the Torah perfectly in order to be in right standing with the Lord. He says, if you're going to say you have to do circumcision for a Gentile to become physically Jewish, in order to have right standing with the Lord, then they also have to do everything else physically. And you take the spiritual uh, grace and mercy of God out of the equation. And you put the burden of justification on yourself. And we all know it is physically and fundamentally impossible 
for us to keep the Torah perfectly. Goes on to say, you who are trying to be justified by the Torah, and again, we're talking exactly that. You that are trying to be justified by the Torah, you've been cut off from Messiah, you have fallen away from grace. Now this isn't talking about those who are justified by the Messiah and then choose to walk in his covenant and walk according to his word. Remember last week when we talked in chapter 4 where it gave us the list of things and it said if you do any of these things you shall not inherit the kingdom. So it can't possibly be saying we don't have to obey God's commandments, but it's saying if you're trying to be justified by keeping the Torah, then you've been cut off from the grace of Messiah. That doesn't mean we don't keep the Torah. It means we're not being justified by the Torah. We're being justified by faith and trust in Messiah. Amen. Randy, did you have a question? Is it something that you need to ask now, or can you write it down and I can take it at the end? Okay. For through the Ruach... By faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. I love this verse because uh, around here, we, I, have a, I, I say quite often that words have meanings. And the reason God chose to use certain words in his word was because those words are important. And the meaning of those words are important. And we can't just arbitrarily exchange words. Not all words are synonyms. Synonyms. Synonym. Cinnamon. Synonym. I'll get a synonym. Not all words are different words that mean the same thing. So we have to understand that. And he says, For through the Ruach, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. What is he saying? He's saying that we are redeemed, but we're awaiting the fullness of righteousness would come when he returns, and we are saved. The, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. I know that for some people, especially those watching this that haven't heard me teach about this before, Israel was redeemed from Egypt by the power and the mighty hand of God. But they didn't receive the fullness of the promise until they made it through the 40 years in the wilderness. They crossed the Jordan River and they entered into the promised land. That is the picture of our redemption leading to salvation. So he says here, through the Ruach, through God's Spirit, by faith, we're eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness is the end, where God does all that he's going to do, and we live with him in the world to come. For in Messiah, Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any meaning, but only trust and faithfulness expressing itself through love. Now I want to stop here for just a minute. I want to you guys to think about what he says in Romans where he says what value is circumcision much in every way now the difference is that in Romans he was talking to Jewish people and saying the covenant of circumcision with Abraham has great value it's a promise God made with the Jewish people with the children of Abraham and it has great value but here he's talking to Gentiles and he's saying to them that it's not circumcision or uncircumcision that makes you born again that makes you have the, uh, receive the grace and, and forgiveness of God, only faithfulness and expressing itself through love. In other words, we express our love for God in faithfulness. He expresses his love for us in his faithfulness. And so it's not that circumcision has no value. Paul says it has great value, much in every way, he said in Romans. But here he's talking to Gentiles who are trying to be forced to have physical circumcision because the, these Jewish people are saying you're not really right with the Lord unless you do this. And he's saying it's not circumcision or uncircumcision that makes the difference. It's faithfulness expressed through love. You were running a great race who blocked you from following the truth. And what he's saying here, remember, that he had these people that he'd been there before. He's been ministering to the Galatians before. And they were doing good. They were walking with the Lord. They were running the race. And then he said, but who blocked you from following the truth? Why did you allow something to happen to block you from following the truth? And I don't know uh, about you, but I can, I can look back at my life at many times where I allowed other people to block me from following the truth for a period of time. Whether it was me allowing people to get under my skin. Any of y'all ever get angry at somebody and act in an ungodly way? You don't have to raise your hand. We'll just trust that all of us have done that. Yes. Or... Um, 
or allowed a, a bad situation, someone in your family dies or something happens, or uh, my wife has been through two house fires in her life, and, uh, you know, so there's things, major things that can cause us to have a block, to, to question our, our place, to fall back from where we should be. And he said, you were running this great race. You were doing good. Who blocked you from following the truth? And then he said, this detour doesn't come from the one who calls you. He said, this, this detour, this thing that's happening, it doesn't come from God. It's coming from the adversary, the deceiver. And he says, a little chametz works its way through the whole batch of dough. And I didn't understand that until the first time my wife baked uh, bread because I never actually saw that happen. You know, I grew up where when you needed bread, you went to the grocery store. And uh, so I didn't know what yeast did in bread. And uh, she was making loaves of bread and she had these little bitty packages of, of yeast and it only took part of it to make the, the dough rise and it just takes a little bit. And he's saying, look, this, this it only takes a little false teaching to affect the whole batch of dough. And I'm telling you, as we study Galatians and those that read the book, which goes into a little more detail in some of these things, this bad teaching about what Galatians is about has leavened the entire or most of the entire body of Messiah with bad foundations of what they believe as concerns these things. So we end up with teachings like the Old Testament was for the Jews and the New Testament's for the Gentiles, or there's the Torah versus grace when the Torah is filled with grace. And so it just takes one little bit of leaven to leaven the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will not think otherwise, but the one who is confusing you will, he, he will pay the penalty, whoever he is. Now, I want to tell you, I love Paul. Paul is an amazing human being that within his scriptures, the, the letters he writes, he shows his humanity, he shows his faith and trust in God, and he doesn't water things down. And he says to them, I'm confident that you're going to do right, that you're going to that you're going to know and you're going to change. He said, but the person who's confusing you, he's going to pay penalty, whoever he is. He doesn't water down, oh, oh it's gonna, you know, we'll, we'll just overlook it. And then, he says he's going to pay a penalty. As for me, brothers and sisters, if I still proclaim circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the stumbling block of the cross has been eliminated. Now, I want to refer you to the book of Acts where Paul is being accused by the leaders in Jerusalem that he was teaching Jews not to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And James says, we know that's not true. And we know that you are teaching this. And so what I want you to do is go bring these three men and make a sacrifice, a Nazarene uh, sacrifice, a Nazarite sacrifice. And, uh, and so Paul is not saying he doesn't teach circumcision because he does teach circumcision. And Romans talks about that also. But he's saying if I still proclaim circumcision for redemption, for justification for that God needs us to be circumcised in order to be right that Gentiles have to become Jewish in order to have right standing with God he says why am I being persecuted by the Jews if I'm teaching people that they have to become Jews why would the Jews be upset with me why would I still be persecuted he said in that case the stumbling block of the cross would be eliminated if I was saying you were saved by some means other than through faith in Messiah Yeshua that you were saved by just simply being Jewish then the stumbling block of the cross is taken away. The cross has, is not in, the, in a factor in anymore. We're, we believe that it's through the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah that we have redemption. But if we're redeemed because we have an operation, then that takes that away. And then why would the rest of the Jewish community be upset with Paul if he was trying to get people to just follow physical circumcision and the Torah by for justification rather than through faith in Messiah Yeshua? Galatians 5.12, I only wish those who are agitating you would castrate themselves. Now, I'll tell you, Paul is a little bold. Paul, you know, you know he, he's not pulling punches. He just, you know, basically he's saying if they want to take a little, they should just take it all. 
it, it's, you know, it, it's what he, he's saying. I, I only wish those that are at you, those problem makers, would just castrate this, just be done with it. That's a little, um, you know, people say, oh, Rabbi, you have to be nice to folks. You can't say things like that. Paul said, you know, it's pretty, pretty, uh, we would consider that maybe over the top, but it's not. Brothers and sisters, you were called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole Torah can be summed up in a single saying, love your neighbor as yourself. Now I want to stop here for just a minute, and I want to point out that Paul is not teaching not to observe the Torah. He's actually teaching observance of the Torah. He said, you want to observe the Torah? Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole Torah is summed up. He didn't say, you want to live by grace? Love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say that. He said, if you want to, uh, the whole Torah can be summed up in one saying. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not destroyed by one another. If you're fighting amongst yourselves, I, I watched a uh, few minutes of a preacher the other day. And I can't remember who it was, and it really doesn't matter. But in his message, he said, you know, throughout the entire Bible, we never once see Satan or demons fighting amongst themselves. Not once in the entire scriptures do we ever see Satan, Hasatan, or fallen angels fighting against each other. That's saved for the believers. That's a pretty strong but true statement. Paul's saying, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not destroyed by one another. Don't fight against each other. Doesn't mean we can't study, disagree, have strong debates about what we believe and what we don't, but don't bite and don't devour one another. But I say, walk by the Ruach, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So Paul is saying, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. I don't know how many people I've had tell me, Rabbi, I don't need a whole list of laws. I just follow the Spirit. I'll just let the Spirit lead me. Uh, the next verse says, for the flesh sets its desires against the Ruach, but the Ruach sets its desires against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you cannot do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And this is one of those verses that people want to pull out and say, See, if you're led by the Spirit, by the Ruach, you're not under the law. The next verse says, Idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissension, <clears throat> factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. And we'll stop there to say that is a list of all of the negative commandments in the Bible. Every commandment that God says not to do. Every Torah commandment there is that God says don't do these in the Torah is listed. This is like headings in an outline for all of the things. I am the Lord thy God. You shall have no other gods before me. Idolatry. Witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. Carousing, by the way, is a nice way to say in, 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 immorality. immorality, sexual immorality and such. All of these things. So he's saying you're not under the law because you're led by the Ruach. And then he says idolatry, witchcraft, hostility. And he goes, I'm warning you, just as I warned you before. That those who do such things will not inherit God's kingdom. So he's not saying if you're led by the Ruach, you're not, you don't have to obey the commandments or you don't have to live according to God's word. Because he goes on to say, look, all these things, if you do them, you shall not inherit God's kingdom. Now I want to point out something really important right here. Who is he writing this to? Gentile believers? He's writing it to Gentile believers. Believers. These are people that are already believers. These are people that already have been born again. And he's telling born again people, 
If you do these things, you shall not inherit the kingdom. 522. But the fruit of the Ruach is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If that other list was the list of commandments that we're not supposed to do, every one of the positive commandments, the things that the Lord says, you will do these things, this covers all of them. And he says, against such things there's no law. And it's interesting because uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, uh, Self-control covers all those things like thou shalt not work on the Sabbath. But I have to. No, you should have self-control. You know, all of those things. This, he's saying these are, these are the things you should have, you should do. And he says against things, there, there are no law. So the people who say, well, we don't have to do those things anymore because it's been changed. And if you do them, you're putting uh, Jesus uh, you, to, to crucify him again and, and all that stuff. He says, no, 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 no. Doing these things, there's no law against doing the good things. There's nothing that tells you not to do the good things. There's not an instruction that says, now that you're a believer, you can't walk righteously. That's not what it's saying. He says, now those who belong to Messiah have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's pretty straightforward. If you walk in the spirit you're not going to do the things the bible calls sin you will do the things that the bible calls righteous if we live by the ruach let us also walk by the ruach let us not become conceited provoking one another envying one another and that's by the way one of those difficult things that we deal with in the messianic movement uh in the messianic movement in the hebrew roots movement there's a whole lot of provoking that goes on there's a whole lot of becoming conceited we're right you're wrong everything you do is pagan everything we do is holy there's a lot of conceit that is in that realm and, and he's teaching and saying don't be like that uh, that doesn't mean you can't teach people how to do right but you do it in a godly way God doesn't condemn he convicts condemnation is stepping on conviction is lifting up it says Provoking one another, envying one another. Those are things that we shouldn't do. Brothers and sisters, if someone's caught doing something wrong, you are directed by the Ruach. Restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, looking closely at yourself so that you are not tempted also. Now, specifically, he's talking about these people that we're talking about. You know, these, these people in Galatia that have been led astray by this false gospel that they have to physically become Jewish in order to be born again, that Gentiles have to go through the ritual of circumcision, have a Brit Malah in order to be part of the kingdom, to be right with the Lord. That's what he's speaking to in context here is that group. But I think it goes beyond that to our situations today, that when we see someone's caught doing something wrong, we are to restore that person. <laughs> Restoration. If you are restoring a car, when you're done with the restoration, that car is supposed to look like it came out of the showroom. Brand new, never been scratched, never been dinged, never been damaged, no sun damage, nothing at all. When someone in the body of Messiah is caught doing something wrong and they repent, we are to restore them. Now, I want to say very clearly that doesn't mean that if uh, Seth gets caught doing something wrong, like you know, robbing a bank, uh, cheating on his taxes, uh, something like that, that and and if he's in leadership in our community and he's a teacher and he's and and then he says, "Oh, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, Lord, forgive me, and you forgive me." That doesn't mean the next day I say, "Okay." Seth, ignore all that stuff that happened. You just keep go right back up and teach. Restoration means you put pieces back <laughs> together until it's back as it was before. Sometimes that takes time. Sometimes that takes a lot of effort. You know, sanding and, and painting and exchanging parts and doing things. 
you don't get a car and say, I'm going to restore this, and the next day it's fully restored and everything's backed away. It takes time to do it. We're supposed to restore that person in a spirit of gentleness, and we need to look closely at ourselves while we're doing it that we're not tempted also. In other words, there's a danger that in restoring someone else because they fell, we will lift ourselves up to a position where we think we're better than them. And that they're subservient to us rather than a brother or a sister that's on the same level with the Lord as we are, equally loved by God as we are, who has fallen and we're restoring them and helping them back to where they need to be. We don't want to uh, be tempted to fall in the process of helping somebody else. It's kind of like when I was a, uh, going through EMT school. They would tell us when you, when you get to a scene... Before you jump out of the ambulance to go rescue people, make sure it's safe. You know, if a power line's down, don't run out in there. If they're, you know, in an unsafe place, if they're, you know, that old the TV thing where the car, you know, runs and it's on teetering on the cliff. Yeah. You know, every TV show has that scene where somebody's teetering on the cliff and the person jumps out onto the car. Don't do that. Don't do it spiritually. Don't do it physically. Two dead people is not better than one dead person. Bear one another's burdens, chapter 6, uh, 2. Bear one another's burdens and this way you will for fulfill the Torah Messiah. I love this verse because it's telling us to help one another, to bear one another's burdens and it's really talking this in a spiritual sense, help carry people when they're fallen, help them to, <laughs> to be what they need to be. You know, it's kind of like when you're uh, my grandchild, uh, he'll want to walk. And so I'll put him down on the ground and he'll walk for a while and then he gets tired. And then I pick him up and I carry him the rest of the way. That's what we're talking about here. It doesn't mean do it for them. It means help them to do it. For if anyone thinks he's something when he is nothing, he's fooling himself. Again, I love Paul. Anytime you think you're something, you're really nothing. And uh, don't fool yourself. Rather, let each one examine his own work. Then he'll have pride in himself alone and not in comparison to anyone else. Now I want to point out something. Pride is not bad. Bad pride is bad. It actually says, have pride in yourself. Look at what God did to you. Testify about what God's done in your life. How he's blessed you. How he's provided for you. One of the cool things about the offering that's brought to the temple on the feast days, you know, we have the three pilgrimage feasts, and the commandment says, take the offering and bring it in front of everybody to the priest and tell them how God has blessed you. Amen. Show them how God has blessed you. But we don't do enough of that. We, we tend to uh, focus on the bad that goes in our life, and we don't always share all the good that God does and how he blesses us and how we can have pride in where God brought me from. I look at my life. I see what God did to get me where I am today. I've got a long ways to go, but I'm sure not where I was. Amen. And I can have pride that God did that and that I'm not what I used to be. But I can't compare myself to anybody else because nobody else is me. That's right. Amen. And each of us fight our own fights. Each of us come from a different place. And each of us are going. If we're walking with the Lord, we're going the same place, but we're coming from different places. And each of us have our own baggage that we started with that God is whittling off of us. Amen. It says, uh, not in comparison to anyone else. And then verse 5. Now remember verse one, uh, verse 2 says, bear one of those burdens in this way you fulfill the Torah. Verse 5 says, for each one will carry his own load. Bear one other's burdens, carry your own load. That's not contradicting things. It's understanding that we have a responsibility to carry our own load, but we should help each other carry each other's loads. Now let the one who's taught the word share all good things with his teacher. I love this. Uh, and it's something that we do on Wednesday nights and Thursday nights. So Wednesday night at the Drowsy Poet, Thursday night in Pace where we get together and everybody shares what God showed them that day. 
they, they look at the scriptures and they dig through the scriptures and they find something. And I sit there and people share with me and, and teach me and share the good things that they've learned from the Lord and the good things that God's done with them and for them. Share it with your teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Again, keeping in context. He's talking in context about these Gentile believers who do not have to be circumcised in order to be right with the Lord, but do have to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. They do have to obey God's commandments, but not for their justification because Yeshua is their justification and the righteousness comes from him. And then it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. That's, by the way, from the Torah. And if it was that we didn't have any responsibility and our actions had no consequences on our life because God's grace did away with the Torah, we don't have to do it, then why would we be talking about sowing and reaping? That's right. Why would that even be a conversation we're having? If you couldn't so un if you couldn't be unrighteous, if you can't sin because now you're covered by grace and there's nothing you can do, then then how would you sow unrighteousness and how would you reap that? Likewise, if you sow righteousness, you'll receive blessings, which is also Torah. For the one who sows in the flesh will reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows in the ruach will reap from the rich, uh, from the ruach eternal life. And again, how do we get eternal life? We first get redeemed. We live for the Lord, and He takes us to eternal life. Look at it. The one who sows in the ruach will reap. The Ruach, from the Ruach, eternal life. Um, James said it this way, faith without works is dead. If you really have faith, you'll have works. You show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. So let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we don't give up. Now listen, this verse is often quoted but rarely quoted in context. Why is he saying do not lose heart in doing good? It goes right back to Abraham. <coughs> God promised him a promise, and when it didn't happen quick enough, Abraham tried to help God out. Mm -hmm. Do not lose heart in doing good. What is doing good? Walking with the Lord, living righteously, doing what we're supposed to do. For in due time we will reap if we do not give up. Every place in the Bible where we see God's people fail, if we look, we'll find that they just weren't willing to wait until the promise came. Even Samson, Shimshon, God said, you're going to deliver the Jews from the Philistines. Samson doesn't wait. He doesn't. He does it. He gets what he wants. He goes after the flesh, does things in the flesh, gets married to the wrong girl, gets blinded. And at the end, he says to the Lord, if you'll just give me strength, I'll, and pillars fall, everything, and Samson dies. Samson didn't have to die. He could have delivered Israel from the Philistines without having to die. But he just lost heart waiting on God to do what God was going to do. And we see that over and over and over through Scripture. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, let us do good toward all. Do good. Why do we have to do things? We don't have to do works. We don't have a responsibility to do anything. God does everything. It's not about our works. It's about, no. Whenever we have an opportunity, let us do good toward all, especially those who belong to the household of faith. And again, sometimes we're the worst people to the people we're supposed to be the best to. I don't know how many times I've talked to business people who say, I won't do business with believers. Unbelievers pay their bills. Unbelievers don't cheat. Unbelievers don't steal. Unbelievers. But those believers, it, it just it's a shame that we are the worst to the people we're supposed to be the best to. Notice the large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. This is Paul 
and he's, he actually wrote this letter himself rather than having a scribe. And if we remember a couple of chapters back where Paul says, you guys love me so much that if you could, you just pull out your eyes and give them to me so that I could see. Paul had difficulty seeing, so he had to write his letter with big letters. I, I walked in the office earlier today and uh, Rivka had on her screen on her computer, which is already this big, she had letters that were that tall going across the screen. I was like, you remind me of Paul. See how big these letters are? I said, I'm writing with your, my own hand. This was such an important thing to Paul that he didn't delegate it to somebody else to write. He wanted to write it himself. Amen. Those wanting to look good outwardly are trying to force you to be circumcised only so they will not be persecuted for the cross of Messiah. Now listen, over the years there have been a lot of times that uh, Messianic leaders, some of them, compromise truth in order to get along with people from the Jewish community. Uh, there are those that say Yeshua isn't God. He's just the Messiah. He's just a man who is the Messiah in hopes that people would believe in Yeshua and they wouldn't offend the Jewish community who doesn't believe that God could become a man, walk on the earth. No. So they compromise truth in order to get... And he's saying... Those that want to look good outwardly are trying to force you just so they won't be persecuted for the cross of Messiah. Mm -hmm. Listen, we're going to be persecuted. Amen. I talked to people uh, today, several people, they said, you know, I was trying to share the good news with somebody and they just got angry with me. They just got, they made me feel that. They just, just, but the truth is, if you stand for the Lord, the world is going to persecute you, whether it's the Jewish world whether it's the non-believing world or whether it's the Christian world, because yeah. unfortunately we get it from all sides. Amen. And it's going to happen. We're going to be persecuted for that. For not even the circumcised keep the Torah themselves, yet they want you to have you. They want to have you circumcised so they might boast about your flesh. What they're saying there is they don't even keep the law. If they did, they wouldn't be pushing this, but beyond that, they don't keep the law all themselves. They're not good enough to be justified by the law. Why would they think you have to be justified by the law? And then you say, they're only doing this so they can boast in your flesh. In other words, they're talking about how we get more numbers. That's right. You know, people say, well, I won 500 people to the Lord. Did you really? My Bible says that nobody comes to the Lord unless God draw him. And unless you're God, you didn't win those people to the Lord. That's right. It's just not how it works. People want to boast in numbers. But may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Through him the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul says it's not about boasting. It's not about numbers. It's not about notoriety. It's not about all those things. It's about Yeshua. Anytime we take Yeshua out of the equation, we end up in flesh, in worldliness, in pride and arrogance and all the things we were just taught not to do. When it's about numbers, you know, it, it, it's funny. When we were in Mobile Tree of Life, we started from, from our congregation. We had people that were driving from uh, Pensacola. And we had about 20, 25 people who were driving to Mobile every Friday night for service. And I said, you know what? We're just going to start a congregation in Pensacola with that 25 people. And people said, but... That's going to be 25 people that are at your service in Mobile that aren't going to be there, and they're not going to be giving, and they're not going to, you know, and your numbers are going to, your congregation's going to shrink. And, and I said, I don't care. It doesn't make sense for 25 people to drive an hour instead of one car. So we started that, and, and then we started one in Pascagoula, uh, Escataba, actually, and we started one in Slidell, Louisiana, and we started one in Foley. And every time our congregation would grow, and then we would pair off. You know, 25 went here, 25 went there, and 30 went there, and we started new congregations. But each time we did that, our congregation, just like a bush that you prune, it grows more. Same thing happened. People say, I can't believe you're, you're doing this. You're, you're losing money. Every time you, somebody leaves, uh, the money goes there, and then has it. I say, I don't care. It's not about numbers. It's not about my kingdom. It's about his kingdom. Amen. We have people all the time that come to our service for some reason. They don't know there's a congregation in Navarre. I don't know how many times people come up and say, Rabbi, I'm visiting. We moved to Navarre. And I say, you, well, you know there's a congregation in Navarre. No, I didn't know that. So, yeah, you, there's no reason you to drive here when there's a congregation there. Go be in that congregation there. Be part of that community there. They're, they need good people. Go be good there. And, uh, you know, same thing with Daphne. We have people that come from 
Baldwin County and they say, uh, you know, we're visiting from uh, over in Daphne or Spanish Fort or, or Malbus or, and, and say, well, you know, there's a congregation over there you can go to. And people say, why do you do that? You're, you're, instead of those people coming in, they could be part of your congregation because they are part of my congregation. There's only one congregation. It's God's. So if a miracle happens in Africa, a miracle happened in my congregation. If a revival takes place in Japan, a miracle happened in my congregation. If something happens in Daphne, it happened in my congregation. Now, I'm not the rabbi. Yeshua is. Amen. We're all part of his kingdom. So it's not about gaining numbers and, and being able to say, oh, we have this many people. You know, I, I joke because I came back from the conference and people say, how many people do you have in your congregation? And we say between three and, five, and 400. And, and three and four, and they assume we mean three hundred and four hundred, but I, I just mean three and four hundred. And it's an honest thing. They want them to assume that, but that's that's because people are numbers driven. They want to how big are you? How because they judge success by numbers. Paul says we judge success by Yeshua. How much Yeshua is there? Not how many people is there? Because if we get enough Yeshua here, people will come. We won't have to worry about that. For, ne for neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything but only a new creation. Are you born again? That's the only answer. It's not are you Jewish. I'm Jewish, but that didn't make me holy. It didn't make me righteous. I lived an unrighteous life as a Jewish person who became agnostic and didn't, wasn't even sure there was a God. Until I became a new creation. Those of you that are Gentiles... You're from a non-Jewish background. Are you a new creation? It's not are you Jewish or Gentile. Jews don't get brownie points. It's not like we get extra credit toward heaven. Or we start out like, you know, in, uh, if you're in the military and you get out and you go to work for the government, you get extra points on the civil service exam. Jews don't get those. We don't get extra points on the exam just because we're Jewish. We're, we both get saved exactly the same. Miriam, Yeshua's mother, was born again exactly like the rest of the 120 in the upper room. And exactly like the 3,000 that were born and the 5,000 that were born again. The, the, the woman that God said, there's no woman more blessed than you. She had to become a new creation just like every Amen. one Amen. else. Now, as many of you live by this rule, shalom and mercy on them and on the God of Israel. If, and he's basically just saying, look, if you live by what I'm saying, you're going to have shalom and you're going to have mercy. <coughs> From now on, let no one make trouble for me, for I bear on my body the scars of Yeshua. The grace of our Lord Yeshua and the, the Messiah be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Paul is the epitome of a father right here. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Talking to his children and saying, just don't cause me any more problems. I'm old, I'm tired, I'm sore, I've been beaten, I've been shipwrecked, I've been all this. Just please, just behave yourselves. I'm going to turn my back. You guys behave for five minutes. Can't you please behave? For just... Paul is the epitome of a father and he just says, from now on, don't make any more trouble for me. For I bear on my body the scars of Yeshua. And he closes by saying, the grace of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. And that's how the book ends. Amen. Amen.